The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. My name is James, and on this show, we talk about the equipment found on your electronics workbench. Here's a box of cheap film capacitors I bought recently. I was curious how close their values matched. One option would be to use a DMM with a capacitance measurement. However, since capacitors like these get used in a filter circuit, it is important to understand how their characteristics change with frequency. And that is where this Tenma LCR meter comes in. It looks like a multimeter, but it is not. While it can measure capacitance and inductance, it can also measure parameters like dissipation factor and ESR at various frequencies. In this episode, we talk about how to use an LCR meter to measure capacitors, inductors, and even resistors. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started by comparing these two meters. Digital multimeters measure characteristics of components and a circuit, while an LCR meter only measures the characteristics of certain components. The reason you need a special meter for capacitors and inductors is because they are reactive. Their values change with frequency. So to correctly measure them, you need an AC signal. Now, resistors have resistance and reactive components have reactance. Both of these make up impedance. For a pure resistor, impedance is basically just the resistive value. But for a capacitor or inductor, impedance is a combination of resistance and reactance. So then where does the reactance come from? Well, for lack of better words, it is a frequency dependent resistance. A capacitor's reactance is one over two times pi times the frequency times the capacitance while an inductor's reactance is two times pi times frequency times the inductance. An LCR meter measures the impedance with an AC signal to determine reactance. By the way, when I say AC, I mean small signal AC and not mains AC coming out of the wall. When measuring a component, you can think of a DMM as making DC measurements and an LCR meter making AC measurements. To illustrate that difference, let's look at their measurements on an oscilloscope. Check out this Tenma Capacitor Decade Box. As I change the switches, it changes its capacitance value. I'm going to use this and my oscilloscope to demonstrate how the meters work. First, I have attached the DMM and set it to capacitor mode. On the scope screen, we see a sawtooth waveform. And yes, I know, this is not a DC signal. Or is it? I'll come back to that in just a minute. As I increase the capacitance, the frequency of the measured waveform goes up until I hit one microfarad, causing the meter to change ranges. So now I'll make some adjustments on the scope so that we can clearly see what the meter is doing. Here we see the waveform shorts the plus and minus terminals together, applies a voltage, and then measures the time it takes to charge up. The key point here is the peak to peak voltage is the same for all the capacitors. The meter is only applying a DC voltage, causing this RC charging curve. Next, let's take a look at the LCR meter. Here, the frequency stays constant as I adjust the capacitor, but notice the peak-to-peak -peak voltage. It changes based on the capacitance value. So this meter is effectively measuring an AC voltage divider. Now, one thing I cannot show you is the current through the capacitor box, and that value is important because AC signals applied to a capacitor or inductor cause voltage and current to become out of phase. And just like resistance, to measure impedance, you need both voltage and current. The current probe I have for my oscilloscope is not sensitive enough for this small AC current, but if I could measure it, the waveforms might look something like this screenshot. The yellow trace is the voltage and the white trace is the current with the current leading the voltage since it is a capacitor. Okay, now let's go through the steps of using a handheld LCR meter. I'm going to stick with capacitors since I understand them better than inductors, but as reactive components, they are similar to a certain degree. To get started, we need to make a connection. 
The first thing to know before you stick a capacitor into an LCR or a DMM for that matter is that you must discharge it. You might be tempted to just short the leads and on a small capacitor that might be okay. A better practice is to connect a resistor for a few seconds to bleed the charge off safely. To connect the capacitor, you could use an alligator clip or mini grabbers like a traditional meter, but unshielded long wires can affect the measurement. Check out these surface mount tweezers. Notice how they have three leads. The positive and negative probe tips have a signal wire with a shield. That shield is connected to the third wire, which connects to the meter's guard input. You can think of the guard like a circuit's ground, but the proper term for it is probably return path. To measure through hole components, this clip adapter is more ideal. It plugs into the meter and then components plug into it. If you're just using the meter to spot check some component values, then you are ready to go. But for better measurements, we need to calibrate our test setup first. Whether you use mini grabbers, tweezers, or the clip adapter, these probes all have some inductance, capacitance, and resistance associated with them. More expensive and bigger instruments support four wire measurements, which are more accurate. In a previous episode, we talked about four wire in regards to resistance measurements with a bench multimeter. The same concept applies to an LCR, so check the show notes for a link to that video if you are not familiar with them. Instead of a four wire measurement, this handheld has a calibration function. It mathematically removes the effects of the probe. The procedure takes about one minute for this meter. It starts by measuring an open for 30 seconds, and then it needs to measure a short. For the tweezers, just connect them together. If using the through hole adapter, a piece of metal like the one that came with this 10 meter shorts the terminals together. Once the lead calibration is done, we are ready to put the meter into capacitance mode and make the first measurement. Here is an aluminum electrolytic capacitor. The cathode is inserted on the side connected to the meter's negative terminal. With the meter in capacitance mode, it shows the value as 422 microfarads. Let's identify each of the areas of the screen. The large numbers show the primary measurement. To its left is the mode. This meter supports capacitance, resistance, DC resistance, which causes the meter to work like the resistance mode on a regular DMM, and finally, inductance. Below that area is an indicator for the frequency, which right now is one kilohertz. And to the right of that is a secondary measurement area with its own mode indicator. That display can show quality factor, ESR, phase angle, and dissipation factor. Since reactive components change values with frequency, let's talk about how to set that next. This particular meter defaults to one kilohertz, but it supports other frequencies. This tantalum capacitor measures 100 microfarads at 100 hertz. As I increase frequency, it changes to 99.1 at 1 kilohertz, 83.9 at 10, and OL farads at 100 kilohertz. What are LOL farads? Oh, it's not getting a measurement at that frequency, which suggests the capacitor probably doesn't work so great at high frequency. So how do you know which frequency to measure with? Well, you should know because of the frequency being applied in your circuit. Then you just set the meter close to whatever that frequency is. If you're trying to verify components, check their data sheet. It should list the measurement conditions, including a test frequency. In general, the larger the capacitor or inductor, the lower the frequency it operates at. Earlier when I showed the modes, you might have noticed we were in CS mode. That means capacitor series model. Next, we need to talk about the two different models used to measure components. Of all of the controls on an LCR meter, the series parallel selection can be the most confusing. It determines how the meter treats the component's resistance, which is how it determines the reactance. If these models were only made up of pure resistance and pure reactance, then mathematically they would be the same. However, real measurements with real components do not get pure results. 
The problem is that the meter is making limited measurements to determine the impedance of the device under test, approximating the component's value to calculate reactance, which then determines an estimate of the resistive element. In reality, capacitors, inductors, and even resistors have series and parallel elements. These confuse the meter, so sometimes we have to help it understand how to interpret what it is measuring. If the device under test has a large reactance, then the current should be small, meaning the series resistance is less critical. In that case, the parallel mode is probably more accurate. On the other hand, if you have a small reactance, then the current is going to be relatively high and the series resistive element is more critical, so use the series mode. In summary, for a small reactance, which is a large capacitor or small inductor, use series mode. And for a large reactance, which is a small capacitor or large inductor, then use parallel mode. Sorry, that is the best way I can simplify that number. I did want to mention that this meter tries to help. When it is in auto, it selects series or parallel based on the component's value. For now, let's talk about a simple but useful measurement for a handheld LCR meter. A practical example of what you can do is sorting components. For example, here's my box of film capacitors. They keep getting mixed up. I can use the meter to double check that the pile of capacitors are all in the range of 470 nanofarads, or I can use it to sort through the pile of capacitors to find which is closer to the nominal value. To do the sorting, you dial in the desired value and then give the meter what tolerance range to test. From there, insert one component at a time. The meter will either give you a pass or fail. By the way, these were marked as 474J, which means 470 nanofarads plus or minus 5%. As you can see, these were not really 5% tolerance. And that's what I get for not buying quality capacitors from a site like Newark. And on that realization, let's wrap up. So who should buy an LCR meter like this Tenma model? Well, if you're building circuits that involve AC signals like filters, then you definitely want to have something like this. An LCR meter is not a substitute for a DMM. It doesn't measure voltage or current or continuity. It measures the impedance parameters of inductors, capacitors, and resistors. For reference, at the time of making this video, the price for this particular model is about $175. As I briefly mentioned, there are also bench-style LCR meters and more advanced impedance analyzers. Some of these sweep with many frequency points and plot the results. Remember that over on Element 14, you can find show notes for this episode, which includes links related to the products mentioned in this video and some LCR-related stuff from Element 14 community members. By the way, that is the best place to ask me questions because I am more likely to see them. For now, it is time for me to get back to measuring components across an impedance plane on my electronics workbench.